Hi, welcome to Virtual Clusters for Kubernetes Use Cases. I'm Rich Burrows. I'm a senior developer advocate at Loft Labs. We focus on Kubernetes multi-tenancy, self-service, and developer workflows. I am also the creator and host of the KubeCuddle podcast, where I interview people from the Kubernetes community. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, before doing developer relations, I worked in operations and SRE roles for over 20 years, and I was on call for most of that time. So as you can imagine, I have seen some things that I cannot unsee. Um, we're going to be talking today about multi-tenancy, which is sharing Kubernetes clusters with other people. And it turns out that having neighbors and roommates in Kubernetes clusters is hard, just like it is in real life. What we're going to cover today, we'll talk about Kubernetes multi-tenancy models, uh, what virtual Kubernetes clusters are and how they help, and we'll look at some virtual cluster use cases. So what's a tenant when we talk about multi-tenancy? A tenant in a Kubernetes cluster is one or more people who are running workloads in the cluster. A tenant could be an individual user or a team. So think of a team developing a microservice. Um, you've got engineers, maybe uh, an SRE is embedded with them. Um, you're deploying the, the service to the clusters, um, maybe operating it. Um, that whole group would be one tenant. So in the past, we've had um, two Kubernetes multi-tenancy models, uh, namespace-based isolation, and what we'll call cluster-based isolation. Namespace-based, um, tenants are restricted to one or more namespaces using things like role-based access control and network policies. Um, some of the pros, since we're sharing clusters, we have less cluster sprawl and less wasted resources. Um, but the cons, um, first, users, if they're locked down to a namespace, they can't manage global objects like custom resource definitions, and they might be developing some of those objects along with their applications. And that's fine in production. We don't want them managing those things in production, but they should be able to in a dev environment and maybe even a test environment. Um, and another thing, users may need access to multiple namespaces. They might uh, need to run uh, multiple microservices that are running in different namespaces that need to talk to each other. And then you're making network policy exceptions and things can get really complex. And then um, there's cluster-based isolation. So uh, this is Oprah to tell, telling you to look under your chair. Um, everybody gets their own cluster. Um, some of the pros are better isolation, and that can be a big deal if you're in a highly regulated environment. Um, and another thing is that there's less complexity inside of each cluster. So um, one tenant means less things running, um, less net network policies. It's a lot easier to reason about what's happening inside of that individual cluster. But the cons are that it's really hard to manage a lot of Kubernetes clusters. Like, how do you know what's running where and which ones are really being used or which ones should have been decommissioned and weren't, um, which ends up with wasted resources and more cost for your company. As Michael Scott would say, more clusters, more problems. There's another con that I haven't mentioned, which is the impact to the environment. Um, there's a really great talk by Holly Cummins, a uh, keynote at KubeCon a couple of years ago, where she talks about this, and she uses a term that I love, um, zombie clusters, to describe those clusters that are out there. They're running, they have workloads in them, they're using up resources, but they're not even being used anymore. Nobody even needs them. Um, they consume power, and, and that has an impact on the planet. So it's a great talk. I highly recommend it. Um, you can find it on YouTube. All right, so here's our choices, right? Um, namespaces <laughs> or clusters. Um, but now there's a thing called virtual Kubernetes clusters. And a virtual cluster runs inside of a shared host cluster, but it appears to the user as if it's a standalone dedicated cluster. So within this shared Kubernetes cluster, we could have lots of virtual clusters running, and the users all connect to them, um, each as if it's uh, a standalone cluster. 
We're going to talk about one of the implementations of this um, called vCluster today. Um, it's open source. It's been around for a little over a year now. Um, it's the most popular implementation of virtual clusters. And I think that's because it's really fast and easy to use. Um, I think vCluster is also fun to use, and I don't think we should underrate that. Uh, a lot of infrastructure tools aren't fun, and I think that when you get a chance to use one that is, you should definitely embrace that. So how does vCluster work? Um, it runs in a namespace on the host cluster. Uh, it contains a Kubernetes API server and some other tools, and it saves its state in a database, and that's SQLite by default, but it could be etcd or even Postgres. So uh, yeah, here in our shared cluster, we've got multiple namespaces, and within this one, we have a control plane running as a pod. Um, it's got an API server in it, um, and that's our virtual cluster. So a uh, quick look at the vCluster architecture. So these higher level resources in blue are managed by vCluster itself, like the deployments. And then there's a process called a syncer. And the syncer syncs the low level resources like the pods to the host cluster where they're scheduled. Um, so uh, again, it's all running inside of one namespace on the host cluster, and the pods are synced there um, to the host cluster to run. And as you can see, the users connect to um, the vCluster itself to the API server inside of it, um, and they interact with it um, that way. So vCluster supports multiple Kubernetes distributions. Um, the default is K3S, but it also supports K0S. Um, EKS now, thanks to uh, a pull request from Justin Garrison on the AWS team. Thank you, Justin. And uh, what we call vanilla Kubernetes, which is the standard Kubernetes API server. Uh, vCluster itself is also a certified um, Kubernetes distribution by the CNCF. And what that means is that it passes a suite of conformance tests that they have, um, which can give us more confidence in using vCluster. Some other features of vCluster real quick. Um, there's a thing called isolated mode uh, where it creates automatically a pod security standard, um, some resource quotas and a network policy. And that's just a flag that you pass in to invoke that. Um, there's uh, now a way to extend vCluster with uh, a plugin system where you basically can customize the behavior of the syncer. And you can do all kinds of things like that, like have it automatically install a deployment when the vCluster spins up or um, sync certain resources like CRDs or secrets from the host cluster. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. There's a vCluster SDK and the plugins are written in Go. And then um, we've recently added a cluster API provider for vCluster, which means that you can use the standard Kubernetes cluster API to spin up these virtual clusters. So I'm going to do a really quick demo for you um, to let you know how this works. And um, this uh, um, was running in a Docker desktop instance on my Mac. Um, if we connect to it with kubectl, we'll just see the standard namespaces are there. Um, and then we're going to create a new vCluster. I have the vCluster CLI installed. It's a very small Go binary. Um, we pass it the name of the vCluster and the namespace. And it creates the namespace because it didn't already exist. And then um, you'll see it gives us the syntax for the vCluster connect command, which is how we connect to the API server so we can send it commands. Um, so we'll run that now. And again, we just pass in the name of the vCluster and the name of the namespace that it's in. And the connect command sets up port forwarding, um, and that's how we're able to send uh, commands with like kubectl. Um, and as you can see, it writes out a kubeconfig file, and that's how we're going to uh, connect. So um, it puts that file in the same directory that you're in, and we'll reset our kubeconfig environment variable to point at that file. And now we can connect with kubectl and get a list of the namespaces inside of the virtual cluster. And so you see it's just the default namespaces. So we don't see that host namespace one. That's the host, that's the namespace on the host cluster um, that the vCluster is inside of. So we're gonna create an Nginx namespace in the virtual cluster. We're gonna make a deployment with a couple of pods. 
and we'll see that those get running pretty quickly. So um, there we go. All of this again is happening in the virtual cluster inside of that namespace on the host cluster. Um, now let's go back to the host cluster and take a look at the list of the pods that are running in that host namespace one where the virtual cluster is. And what we're gonna see here is the vCluster pod. Um, there's also a core DNS pod, which it uses. And then there's the two Nginx pods. And as you'll see, the Nginx pods have the vCluster name and the namespace inside of the vCluster both embedded in the pod names. And we do that to just make sure that we avoid any collisions. If we've got a bunch of people on the same cluster, they might have vClusters running, a bunch of them might be using Nginx. And so this is how we make sure that there aren't any collisions. All right, so real quick, some use cases. Um, we'll talk about dev environments, um, CICD pipelines, and testing Kubernetes resources. So for a dev environment, we need a local or remote Kubernetes cluster to develop against. We want it to be self-service. We don't want people to open up a ticket for a platform team to make them a cluster or anything like that. Um, we know that um, as fast as we can make this and self-service, um, that that helps the developer cycle time and also helps their happiness, um, which is really good to think about too. Some of the challenges here, um, I said some developers don't want to be a Kubernetes admin. Maybe it should be most developers. And honestly, I don't think they should have to be. You know, they are hired to write an application with some business logic for the company. And um, being a Kubernetes admin is not their job. And what if something weird happens? The cluster gets really messed up. Um, uh, that can happen. So how does vCluster help? Um, creating and deleting clusters takes seconds, and you saw that in the demo. I spun that new virtual cluster up really, really fast. And that means that um, the engineers can spin them up when they need in a self-service way. Um, you actually don't even need any extra permissions. If you're inside a namespace, you don't need to be an admin. If you have the vCluster binary installed on your computer, you can spin up a virtual cluster. And um, you can do that very fast, and you can throw it away if things get messed up and you just want to start over. All right, our second use case, um, CICD pipelines. So um, we're creating and destroying clusters within the pipeline. Um, we want really quick provisioning because of that. And um, we want um, automation. We need to be able to automate this um, in our CICD tool or the test suite itself, however we're going to do that. Some of the challenges. Um, provisioning clusters can be slow. Um, it could take 20 minutes or more to spin up a cluster, um, one of the managed Kubernetes clusters on some cloud providers. So um, we don't want that. We don't. Um, uh, we. We may be provisioning clusters many times within a test suite, right? Um, uh, it's a kind of a common pattern to like run a set of tests and then throw everything away and start over from scratch. And so we could potentially be doing that, you know, multiple times within a test suite. And um, again, this is our CI/CD pipeline, right? So this is how we push changes out to our production environment. Um, if it's slow, then that's going to impact how quickly we can push out changes, um, even things like emergency patches. So how does vCluster help? Um, again, very quick to provision clusters. So you can do that multiple times in a long test suite, and it's not going to add overhead. Um, and potentially, if your tests allow this, you could spin up a bunch of vClusters at the same time and run the test concurrently in them. Um, if you've ever dealt with long test suites, um, this is one of the biggest ways to help. Like any time that you can parallelize those tests, um, it really makes a big impact. Um, and then this third one is testing Kubernetes resources. So what I mean here is something like um, you're developing an operator and you want to test it against multiple versions of Kubernetes, or maybe you just want to test how your application runs, if it's going to run OK when you do this next upgrade. Um, this could be automated, but it could also just be ad hoc. You may just on the spur of the moment want to see something. Um, so some of the challenges here are hardware requirements and cost. Um, if you're doing this on your laptop, it might be painful to spin up a bunch of clusters and, again, provisioning time. Um, we don't want to be sitting around waiting for clusters to spin up. 
How does vCluster help? Um, you can specify the distros version. It's actually double dash version. I think Google Slides gave me an M dash here, but um, uh, if your distro has multiple versions, you can pick one of those. And you could, again, potentially test in parallel. So if I'm testing my operator, I could spin up vClusters running a bunch of different versions of Kubernetes to test against. There are many more use cases. So um, if your thing runs in a Kubernetes cluster, which many things do nowadays, and if you need to create and destroy clusters quickly, um, it might be a use case for vCluster. So to recap again really quick, um, we talked about Kubernetes multi-tenancy models. We talked about uh, what virtual clusters are and how they help. Again, it's a control plane or an API server within a namespace on the shared host cluster. And we talked about those virtual cluster use cases like dev environments, CI, CD, and testing Kubernetes resources. Um, some things to look at if you'd like to know more about vCluster, there's a getting started guide at vcluster.com that is really helpful. Um, there's a GitHub repo for vCluster itself and a separate one for the SDK that you use to write the plugins. Um, and there is also a community Slack uh, which has the maintainers and me and some vCluster users in it. Um, it's a friendly place to come and ask some questions. And you can find me on Twitter as well. Um, I'm at Rich Burroughs there. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate being part of this first platform con. I hope you all uh, enjoyed the talk. I'll be answering questions in the Slack. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.